Russell never had it until I came here.
the lesson for the epistle is written in the second chapter of Acts, beginning at the 14th verse. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that what whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Here endeth the lesson.
Be seated. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm sorry I couldn't be here over a Sunday. I was up in San Mateo at St. Joseph's uh, there on Pentecost and need to get home to Georgia. Um, but I've been here several days and uh, at least thought I could join you today for this Mass and for Bible study at 1030. We're going to bless the font, or to be more precise, I'm going to bless the font with the permission of your rector. Um, so we made sure not to uh, tread on any toes. The bishop's off on a uh, family occasion uh, for the moment, so Father Blake and I are holding down the fort. My text this morning is St. John chapter 14, verse 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Pentecost, Whitsunday, uh, like Easter and Christmas, has a, an octave, a, an eight-day period in which the feast is celebrated. The idea being, I think, that in all three cases, the, the feast is so rich that it takes a little bit more than one day to, to um, meditate on all of the, the facets of it. And I think in the case of Pentecost, uh, what I get from the two readings for the, the main service on uh, Whitsunday itself is that the coming of the Holy Ghost has two main effects or purposes for the church. In John's gospel, the story of Pentecost is not given directly, but we, what we have is the prediction. Uh, in fact, multiple predictions of the future coming of the Holy Spirit or the paraclete, uh, John's preferred term, upon the church after our Lord's departure from the world, which of course uh, for us means after Good Friday, Easter, uh, and then the Ascension. So uh, John speaks about Pentecost as a future event, and the uh, acts then of the apostles describe Pentecost itself. So we have the, the event uh, foreshadowed and then we have the event itself described. So we have then two different views from two different uh, temporal angles of the feast. Now in Acts, the purpose of Pentecost is to make the apostles into effective missionaries to inspire them to spread the good news of Jesus Christ, and in particular, the good news of his crucifixion and resurrection. Our Lord says to the apostles just before his ascension in Acts, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in the Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth which of course is the outline of Acts, the spread of the gospel first within Jerusalem and then Judea, then Samaria, and then throughout the Roman world, concluding with Paul in Rome, which I guess was the uttermost parts of the earth, or the center of the Roman Empire. This power to witness effectively to Christ is illustrated on the day of Pentecost itself, as it is described in Acts, where the gift of tongues and the sermon of St. Peter lead to the first mass conversion to Christianity. The church, we're told, grows on that day from a little band of about 120 people, that original core group, and we're told that Peter's word was gladly received and they were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. So they grow by roughly 25 times. Ever since the church has periodically enjoyed or sometimes suffered from mass success, 
conversions of huge numbers of people or periods where just for some reason there's a sudden embrace of the gospel. The uh, uh, early Middle Ages in Europe, an example of whole tribes, whole, whole uh, ethnic groups coming into the church. And then the church sort of has the problem of, problem of digesting people who are often only half Christianized and have to slowly be taught the faith and slowly learn to make the faith more than a matter of an outward observance. So the church, uh, even sometimes in the midst of persecutions and spiritual dryness and indifference, enjoys these almost miraculous uh, periods of success and also of spiritual renewal and of refreshment. So an example, uh, the great, perhaps the greatest persecution of the church in the ancient world was under the emperor Diocletian, it began in February of two, uh, 303, and uh, many of the martyrs of the church were killed under that persecution, which lasted for, for more than a decade, until the conversion of the emperor, the future emperor, Constantine, and his um, adoption of Christianity as the official religion of the empire. At the beginning of that persecution, nobody could have imagined that 20 years later, the emperor would be Christian and the official religion of the empire would become Christian. Little interesting fact, some of you may have been to Croatia. Uh, there's a town there called Split, or Spoletum in Latin, and uh, Diocletian retired there, and he built a great fortress which contained uh, his palace, and uh, also he built a mausoleum for himself. So Diocletian, the great persecutor of the church, builds this in split. Well, now his mausoleum is the baptistry, where new Christians are made, and part of his palace is a church dedicated to a bishop who Diocletian had killed. So the reversal, how do you explain that except the work of the Holy Spirit? How do we explain the fact that when I was a child and, and for the early decades of, of my life, the Soviet Union was a great persecutor of the church and now cosmonauts carry icons uh, into outer space and uh, Vladimir Putin, who's probably not a nice man, uh, nonetheless gives speeches under giant icons of the, the Virgin and our Lord. So a complete reversal of fortune for Christians, and how do we explain it but the work of the Holy Spirit? So the Holy Spirit enables people, Christians, many without many gifts, perhaps, or not ones you might expect to be leaders to become effective missionaries. The other main purpose, I think, of Pentecost, the one emphasized by Christ in John's gospel, is to lead the church and to keep the church in truth, to teach you all things and to bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. The Holy Ghost preserves the church in truth, and he teaches us all things. Now, he doesn't teach us all things whatsoever. I wish he did. I wish the Holy Spirit had infused into me the names of all of the state capitals. That would have been very useful to me. He doesn't teach us how to do quadratic equations. Right? The Holy Spirit doesn't teach us all things whatsoever. But what he teaches us is all things necessary for our salvation. He brings all things to our remembrance, which means he enables the, uh, the early church, the apostles, the disciples of Jesus, to remember the things taught to them by their Lord that were most important and to eventually record them and preserve them so that the church could enjoy and grow from them. Interesting, right? Our Lord did not come and leave us a book. He came to earth to give us the Holy Spirit, who bestows, is bestowed in and through the church. And then the church produces the Bible. The church 
preserves the Bible, the church teaches the Bible, and the church interprets the Bible. If the Bible, if all of the Bibles in the world disappeared, the Bible would still, could be reconstructed, it would still exist through the church, through the memory of the church and through the worship of the church. It is in the living sacramental world of the church that scripture comes to life so that all things whatsoever Christ said unto us are brought to our minds for our salvation by the Holy Spirit. This promise to the church is a promise of a kind of gift of truth. Now, it doesn't mean that God will keep me personally from falling into error. It doesn't mean that God will keep the Anglican Catholic Church from falling into error. It doesn't even mean that God will keep our generation from falling into error. What it does mean is that over time, the great bulk of the church will be kept and preserved in truth. And so if we look to the consensus of what Christians have always believed in all places over long periods of time, we will have a reliable guide to what we believe. Our Lord promises the Holy Spirit to all of the apostles as a group, both in John and in Acts. So we look to the consensus of the apostolic churches to know what we ought to believe and do. So this week we celebrate the church herself as the sign and fruit of the Holy Spirit amongst us. Let us call upon God the Holy Spirit to enlighten our hearts and minds, to preserve us in the truth, and to inspire us to become effective missionaries to a fallen world. Though we may think we are unlikely instruments of the Spirit's will, you and I are no more unlikely than were the apostles, who after all utterly failed their Lord at the time of his passion. If the Holy Ghost could use them to convert the world, he can use us as well. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And Bishop Scarlett's out of town, so we realized that we asked Bishop Haverlin to bless the font. So. And with thy spirit. Amen. God is our hope. A very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth be moved and though the hills be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof rage and swell, and though the mountains shake at the tempest of the same, there is a river, the streams whereof make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most Highest. God is in the midst of her, therefore shall she not be removed. God shall help her, and that right early. The nations make much ado, and the kingdoms are moved. But God has showed his voice, and the earth shall melt away. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. O come hither and behold the works of the Lord. What destruction he hath brought upon the earth. He maketh wars to cease in all the world. He breaketh the bow and the spear in sunder and burneth the chariots in the fire. Be still then and know that I am God. It will be exalted among the nations, and I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. 
Amen. And with thy spirit. Amen. With thy spirit. Amen. You may be seated. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all.
of sins to all those who have heart and repentance and true faith turn unto him. Have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is meet and right so to do. It is very meet, right, and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, according to whose most true promise the Holy Ghost came down at this time from heaven, lighting upon the disciples to teach them and to lead them into all truth, giving them boldness with fervent zeal, constantly to preach the gospel unto all nations, whereby we have been brought out of darkness and error into the clear light and true knowledge of thee and of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Glory be to thee, O the Lord most high. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord, O stand in the highest. All glory be to thee, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, for that thou of thy tender mercy didst give thine only Son, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made thereby as one oblation of himself once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and did institute, and his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory of that his precious death and sacrifice until his coming again. For the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sin. Do this as often as ye shall drink it in remembrance of me. celebrate and make here before thy divine majesty. With these, thy holy gifts, we now offer unto thee the memorial thy Son hath commanded us to make, having in remembrance his blessed passion and precious death, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, rendering unto thee most hearty thanks for the innumerable benefits procured unto us by the same. And we most humbly beseech Merciful Father, to hear us, and of thy almighty goodness, vouchsafe to bless and sanctify with thy word and holy spirit these thy gifts and creatures of bread and wine, that we, receiving them according to thy Son, our Savior Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body. earnestly desire thy fatherly goodness, mercifully to accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, most humbly beseeching thee to grant that by the merits and death of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and all thy whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And here we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, ourselves, 
except this our bounded duty and service, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom and with whom, in the unity of the Holy Ghost, all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ hath taught us, we are bold to say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.